Carlos no. All right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen from around the world. You are welcome to, quite frankly, one of the most highly anticipated webinars of the year, brought to you by the world famous financial advocates at Naira Metrics. Now, if you, if you don't know Naira Metrics by now, then I, 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 don't, know where you've, I don't know where you've been. Uh, so, this is a very highly anticipated economic outlook where, as usual, Naira Metrics. Uh, which, of course, inform, keeps us informed um, on all the goings on on financial activities around economic and financial activities around not just Nigeria, but around the world, and also gives us crucial advice in terms of where to invest and what headwinds to look out for. Narimetrics, as usual, has got together some of the best um, experts uh, that will be giving us advice, giving us an outlook on this very, very, very crucial 2023 uh, we all know what's going on. We've got elections in less than how many days um, this month. Uh, you've also got <laughs> everything else that's going on from Naira scarcity on one side of the street to fuel scarcity on the other. So um, I'm Rosu Sodiri. Uh, I host the Global Business Report on Rice TV, uh, Business Express on Smooth FM. And I am very, very happy to you know, introduce this incredible panel. Uh, first of all, starting with the main man uh, himself. Let's go through some of these uh, introductions here. The, 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 the silver fox, uh, founder of Naira Metrics, uh, Mr. Ugo Dre. <laughs> Good morning to you. Very, 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 very welcome. Thank you so much uh, for, for being part of this, uh, of this uh, webinar. Uh, we've also got um, uh, some very highly esteemed uh, panelists that are with us that are also going to be giving us their expert analysis in terms of um, what they expect down the line. Uh, let's see now, we've got Mr. Do we have our, let's get our panelists up here. Hold on a second. All right, there we go. So let's pull up, uh, let me get, let's get you uh, introduced to the panelists. Yes, so Kalu Aja, certified financial education instructor. I mean, you have to follow Kalu on on, on, on Twitter where he, he discusses a whole range of, of issues. Uh, certified financial education instructor, astute professional with extensive experience in capital market operations, treasury investment, asset management, and occupational uh, pension services. He's got over 22 years of composite experience gained over the years working with UAC of Nigeria as a brand manager, BGL Limited, where he worked on the institutional pension desk, Fidelity Bank PLC, where he headed the asset management desk for the private banking units, and FCMB Pensions PFA, where he was part of the pioneers that set up the, the PFA from scratch and held the position of the CEO, retired from the PFA with over 250 billion assets under management. Kalu, you are welcome. Good morning to you. Um, we've also got on our uh, panel, uh, she's of course going to be joining us as well, uh, Rolaki Akinkube Filani, Chief Commercial Officer at Mixta Africa, award winning and versatile energy and infrastructure sector executive, more than 17 years uh, track record of helping to finance and scale businesses across Africa. She's currently the Chief Commercial Officer of the leading infrastructure developer, uh, helping the group craft and execute its commercial market expansion, revenue optimization, and growth strategies across subsidiary uh, operations in Nigeria, Senegal, Morocco, Tunisia, Cote d'Ivoire. She's got a BSc and MSc degree from the London School of Economics, joint MBA degree from the London School of Economics, HEC School of Management, Paris, and the NYU, New York University's Leonard Stern School of Business. So we're good, great to have Rolake with us uh, as well. We've also got uh, Mr. Dr. Andrew Nevin, PhD, unique 35-year global career as a thinker and a doer, working at the complex intersection of economics, strategy, capital markets, social enterprises, and investment. And his professional career has previously lived in Asia, North America, and Europe. 
It has been based in Nigeria, the world's seventh most populous country since 2012. In fact, he's, he's practically Nigerian. Um, he holds, as I said, a PhD in economics from Harvard University, an MA in philosophy and politics um, from the Loyal College, uh, Oxford University, where he studied as a Rhodes Scholar and scored two goals in the 100th anniversary Blue Eyes Hockey match versus Cambridge and a BSc uh, in computer science and mathematics on the University of Western Ontario, Canada. In April 2011, he was named Strategy Consultant of the Year for 2010 by the Management Consultants Association in the UK. We're very happy to have Dr. Andrew Nevin as well. Good morning to you, sir. Thanks for being with us. Um, also, the man himself, Cheta Mwaze, uh, we, uh, the, the lead partner at SBM uh, Intelligence, heads the research desk. Uh, he has worked in numerous information technology and media organizations, key among them, Daily Times of Nigeria, where he was managing editor uh, for quite a while, and the, the defunct 234 Next. Cheta is passionate about writing. He's published numerous articles in the Sunday Telegraph, the Premium Times, the Cable, and Financial Nigeria, all in Nigeria. His opinion pieces have been published in the Africa Report, Africa is a country, Al Jazeera, uh, The Guardian UK, Super Sports South Africa. Cheta holds a master's in computer networks and internet security from Middlesex University, uh, London, and considers himself a former expert in network design, management, and security. And he tweets at Chickster, C H X T. Cheta, you're very welcome. Thank you so much uh, for, for joining us. So um, we're going to get into it. Um, I believe Ugo Dre is going to take us through, uh, that's again, founder of Nairometrics, he's going to take us through a presentation. He's going to, he's going to lay the groundwork for us, and then we're going to get into some very uh, um, uh, pertinent questions. And also, please, you all out there that are watching, this is an interactive session. We've got a chat box at the bottom of the screen. Throw your questions in there, and if you want, you can address who you want to add your ask, answer your question, or just throw it to the panel. So we'll come to the, the your questions. Very important because there's there's just so much going on. So Ugo Dre, the floor is yours. If you want to uh, lay the groundwork for our discussion today. Oh yes, very much so, Rotus. Thank you so much for uh, for that intro. Uh, good morning, everyone, for wherever you are. Thanks for once again joining our Metrics Economic Outlook for the year 2023. This is the first um, uh, the first one for the year. We usually have about three, uh, three to four every year. Um, so I'm going to be sharing my screen in a bit and um, taking you through a, just a 25 minutes presentation uh, of what my outlook is for the year. So just give me uh, a few minutes and we'll have this uh, set up. Still trying to get the hang of this, of this. Um... It's technology, don't worry, you got, we got you. There you go. Yeah, yeah. We see it. Do you see it? We see, see it. it. Yeah. Oh, great, 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 great. All right, so let me see if I can go on full screen on slideshow. Yes. Ugo, is it Naira scarcity? Is that why you don't have the new Naira notes as your background? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the idea is just to sort of get us, get our mind to what is going on now. So I have about 20, 25 minutes to get this done. So I'm going to move things a little faster. I uh, hope my internet does not disappoint me today. All right, guys, so this is basically the flow. Uh, we're going to talk about geopolitics, uh, 2023 election, and then we'll touch on the economy. And of course, opportunities, which, are, which essentially is what uh, this outlook is about. Uh, we know that we are in a very challenging economy. Uh, things are actually going out right, but there are opportunities out there. And for us uh, at Naira Metrics, it's always about opportunities. How do we find opportunities amidst all the challenges uh, that we have? So. This essentially is the recap of 2022. I'm sure we're all familiar with all these things. This is essentially what happened most of 2022. Uh, Russia-Ukraine war basically torpedoed every single thing uh, that every single projection that anyone had, because no one saw that coming. Uh, and it came about a year ago, uh, uh, you know, last February, and then um, everything just changed. We all changed entirely. And then, you know, we, we suddenly started seeing hyperinflation, which is also what happened. And uh, of course, COVID-19 sort of, you know, I see it ended, but it kind of dwindled down uh, towards, towards the end of 2022. Uh, uh, of course, uh, this time last year was primary elections. Who is it that was going to vote for? Who was going to be the flag bearers? Uh, we know already, but this time last year was hotly a debated topic for months. And of course, insecurity still persists. 
I uh, already mentioned hyperinflation, the CBN cashless policy came towards the end of last year. Uh, exchange rate crisis was with us all through the year. Uh, at some point, we hit, we hit 8, 8, 850 or so to the dollar, and everyone thought that we're probably going to hit 1,000. We did not. We had debt challenges. We still have debt challenges today. Uh, Could oil theft was a major issue uh, last year. Uh, at some point, it was as if government was going to go completely broke if it wasn't arrested. Uh, of course, Jackpot movement went on a different level last year. And Nigerian musicians sort of one way or the other made us proud. I think it's probably one of the best years for Nigerian music last year. Uh, films as well. We've got a lot of you know good movies. And then the rise of skits. Skits turned to something else. And it's, a, it's as if it's a whole new industry on its own. Of course, social media issues. And then we'll have the World Cup, and like the Messi fans are very happy that you finally won the World Cup. And of course, we had a lot of system collapse. I don't know what I've missed though, but this essentially is what we captured. And based on a lot of the content that we put out there on Aerometrics, it gives us a few ideas of what happened last year. So this essentially is what we have. So geopolitics, so what's happening globally? We see that we're in a global, we're in a global world now. And uh, you know, in the global world, anything that happens anywhere has a way of affecting us. And so we start from this map. Look at the US Congress. Um, it's it's a little it's gonna be fractional this year, and that's because um you have the Democrats, you know, uh, in charge of the Senate with very, very slim margin, and of course Republicans. Uh, in charge of the House of Congress, also with a slip margin. So what typically happens is that these guys have a really lock. They never agree on anything. Uh, so and that has a way of affecting all of us, uh, you know, particularly here in Sub-Saharan Africa. And of course, you had a rise of homegrown terrorism in the U.S. That's essentially what they are grappling with right now. So the U.S. has its own internal problems. And when they have internal problems, it does affect what we do, uh, what happens all over the world. And in South, South America, they have issues political issues and that's because the economy has been topsy-turvy uh they're not really sure what policies to put in place sometimes it's socialist policies sometimes capitalist policies but it just doesn't work so um, as much as we complain a lot in nigeria a lot of what is happening here is happening elsewhere as well so, but what you're seeing in south, south america is that they vote you in and then four years after they take you out they bring somebody else so they've been going on and on and on and on like this and they haven't really figured out what formula works and then of course in the eu uh eu has its own issues uh the russia ukraine crisis is affecting them severely there uh they've definitely said now that they're gonna put a, a, a cap on russian russian gas uh, so i think 60 dollar cap uh that's because they're also trying to battle inflation and they don't want russia taking advantage of what's going on um brexit is still hot burner you everyone knows what's happening in the uk not too sure who's who whether the current prime minister is even going to last uh he's having his own internal issues and i move on to the middle list it started already as a hot burner you're already seeing what's happening between the israelis and palestine the iranians also have their own issues uh, there's also, you know, likely going to be a few more crises in the Middle East. We're hoping that that's not going to affect markets that much, but uh, that is one to watch out for. Of course, Russia-Ukraine crisis continues. China, Taiwan, hmm, one eye there. A uh, lot of issues, uh, geopolitical battle going on, a lot of undertones. I, I think yesterday uh, it was the, the U.S. Secretary of State that was considering whether he had to visit China uh, because of some balloon, uh, air balloon um, uh is it, do I call it espionage? But anyway, uh, of course, rise of India. Uh, we'll see what's going on there. India is becoming a geopolitical power. By the way, India is Nigeria's largest uh, export destination. Uh, so we need to also look at what's happening. And India is enjoying all of this because India is just buying cheap crude oil uh, from everybody, wherever it is. But India is a rising geopolitical force. And on and on and on. Of course, we come down to to, to, to Africa as well. We have a lot of aging politicians, aging leaders. Uh, are they going to remain with us this year or next year? Nobody knows. But a lot going on on the African front. And that essentially is the geopolitical map. So what do we look out for this year in Nigeria? This is essentially... Uh, some of the things that we're likely going to face this year, uh, fallout of the 2023 elections, whoever wins, uh, there's always going to be a fallout that typically happens is either the fallout is in the court or the fallout is on the streets. We do hope that it's just going to be on the, in the court alone, let them go to the court and battle it and leave Nigerians alone. But there's always going to be a fallout, of course, lame duck government. That means that you have government that won't be able to take much decisions between February and May because they're basically going out. And of course, bureaucracy is going to be a problem. So for those who are looking to apply for one license or the other to get one approval from government, it's going to be a lot more difficult And now. And of course, insecurity remains uh, a burning issue in Nigeria today. Corruption is also there. We're still in a fiscal and debt crisis. Whoever comes in as president still needs to figure out how to solve that problem because it's still a problem. Inflation is also continues to be the major issue in fact that's 
the overriding theme of this presentation. And of course, the jackpot issue is still there. And we did a poll recently at Diametrics and we asked people, whoever who, if what will make you jackpot, you know, depending on who wins and you don't want to know what the answer is. I'm not going to go in there anyway. Uh, subsidy removal is going to happen this year. Most of the aspirants have all said they're going to remove subsidies. So expect that it's going to be more protests and strikes. Uh, it usually happens when you have a new government. And of course, who knows, there might be more pandemics, not just COVID-19, even though we're seeing a resurgence, but Nigeria also has other pandemics. It's just like it's not as mainstream as COVID-19. So 2023 elections, where are we? These are the four major runners, and these are the issues uh, at stake for all of them. Uh, who is going to win? Nobody knows. They all have different agendas. They all have different uh, uh, you know, political capital that they are riding on. Uh, nobody knows who's going to win, and this is not an election, election debate. But what we do know is that all the candidates seem to be speaking favorably about the economy. Uh, they all want to sort of liberalize the exchange rate regime. They want to change the kind of policies we have now. Uh, they all want fuel subsidy removed. Uh, they want to they want to tackle unemployment. So they all have, you know, essentially very good ideas on the economic front. So they seem to be saying the right thing. But as we all know, it's not just about saying the right thing. It's also about what you do when you eventually get there. It's always easy to just say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. But then when you get there, uh, something else just happens. I don't know. Somebody once said that there's some demon in us who rock that wants to just get it. So like turns your head around. I don't know if that's true. Uh, but we do know that, um, you know, when they actually get their things in. But uh, we got to be very optimistic that whoever gets in there will change things. And that's essentially what we're saying. And that's the thing. They all seem to want to do the same thing. They all seem to want to change things. And very, very good point. It's not all the time you have presidential aspirants who seem to say favorable things for the economy uh, as is. Uh, so Nigerian economy itself, we have this this, this tracker, uh, there are metrics that will basically sort of gauge the health of the economy. And a lot of things are actually bad. And, that, and that's because uh, the indicators are not where we think it should be. Uh, as much as we're still growing GDP growth rate wise, GDP wise um, it's still not fast enough at 2.25%, not that good, uh, slightly lower than what we had before. Inflation is also, uh, as much as inflation reduced slightly in December, it's still pretty high. In fact, I'm one of those who actually think it might probably even higher than what it is now. Uh, if you go back and adjust the CPI, that's the basket uh, of, of or, you know, that, you know, houses the index uh, itself. So uh, the way inflation is basically derived is that they have different things in the basket and they give, give them different weightings. So when you change the weighting, it could actually influence the inflation. But inflation has, has essentially been driven by, by food core, uh, uh, food inflation, essentially. So core inflation, that's what I actually watch. I like to track a lot. I like to track core inflation because core inflation has a way of, of sort of telling you uh, where, where things are. Uh, for businesses, this is the sort of numbers that you should be looking at because this one here is quite volatile. Food makes it volatile. So you look at core inflation. So core inflation at 18%, pretty high. Uh, what that tells you is that interest rates are going to go up. And that is why uh, you can see the CBN also increase their NPR to 17.5%. So all around, uh, doesn't look that good dashboard wise uh, for the economy. You, wanna, you always want to see all these things go green. Uh, rather than red. Uh, the only green we have for now is export. Export kind of went up uh, in in, uh, in 2021 compared to 20, uh, 2020, 2020. And this year as well, it's been inching up uh, slightly. And that's also because we have uh, we are now exporting a lot more oil than we were before. Uh, so that is the health of the economy. So fiscal policy-wise, this is very important for all of us because this is how uh, the government makes you know makes its own money, and as you can see, this is this chart here has gotten straight out from the federal government's uh, federal government's document, the budget document. And as you can see, oil prices uh, this year has uh, inched up, uh, inched up at some point. We're at one thirty, but did we benefit from it? No way. Look at our oil oil output. Oil output was even down when oil prices was high, so we didn't really get the benefit of it. And this is because of crude oil theft. And then, of course, if you compare to prior years, you can see what we're doing in prior years uh, and then look at what we're doing now. So that is essentially why the government is struggling. And if you look at the government's revenue performance itself, look at here, you can see between January and August uh, last year, uh, they budgeted 6.6 .6 trillion. Uh, they only got 4.4 trillion. But guess what? Uh, they wanted to spend 11.5 trillion. They still ended up spending 9.5 trillion. So almost, in fact, more than double their revenue. They spent more than double their revenue, essentially. So, uh, and what happens when you spend more than 
more than your revenue, you borrow, isn't it? And so that's is why borrowing has also gone up for the government. Uh, we've been borrowing. And if you also look at what we spend a lot of money on, you can see recurrent expenditure is like 7.2 trillion of the 9 trillion. 7.2 trillion, let me repeat that, 7.2 trillion of the 9 trillion. And of course, you now have debt service as well as one of those things uh, that we're that we that we spend. So if you split this recurrent expenditure into debt and non-debt, it's almost 50-50 with non-debt recurrent at 3.7 and, and debt at 3.5. So we're actually spending more uh, on debt than we probably are on capital expenditure, as you can see here. Uh, so uh, the challenge the government has always had is that as much as we've been borrowing, most of that borrowing has been going towards recurrent expenditure, whether it's debt or non-debt. Uh, and so what has that done to our loan status. So this is Nigeria's public debt today. We actually included ways and means because you know what? It is our debt. So today, if you look at the data from the uh, um, debt management office, they don't yet include ways and means because the National Assembly has not approved it. But we do know that as a debt and we're currently here, even though we heard that the National Assembly has also approved, uh, and uh, I think for another trillion or so for the government to borrow uh, from the CBN. And here we are, 67.5 trillion. Uh, we hear that we might be hitting 70 something trillion at the end of this year if the government goes ahead and borrows all the money that it wants. But this is our debt. Now, the good thing with these debt numbers is that most of our debt are uh, local debt, local, local, local debt. So if you look at here, almost 70% of our debt is local. And that is why we're, we're doing a lot, a bit much better than, than Ghana, because most of Ghana's debt is. is uh, as external debt. So Nigeria's debt is essentially local. All right. So what will happen? Uh, sorry. Okay. So we go straight into the budget. Yeah. So this is the budget. Uh, so 20.5 trillion uh, is what they want to spend. They're going to borrow their way out of this budget. Uh, and uh, but like I said earlier, I remember I said that we're we we're in essentially in a lame duck session. It's very unlikely that the government will implement all of these things, and the new government may have a different trajectory. Who knows? They might even go to the Senate for a supplementary budget and and essentially sort of adjust everything that the government wants to do. Uh, so, what is the government going to do in light of all of this? Uh oh, my light has gone off. I hope you can all still hear me. Uh, Rotus, please let me know if you can still hear me. We got loud and clear. Loud and clear. Fantastic. All right. So um, we expect to see uh, more taxes. Well, that's what happens whenever government doesn't have money. They ask everybody to pay more taxes. So expect to see more taxes this year. If you're a small business logging in here and you're listening and trying to figure out what's going to happen, expect to see more taxes. Uh, not that they're going to increase taxes, but they're going to be a lot better how to collect taxes. What do you think all these things for e naira, cashless, and all this? It's all about making sure that the government has better visibility into the kind of money that flows into this economy, and that way they can tax better. I expect to see a lot more taxes. They're going to be a lot aggressive about taxes uh, going forward. Now, inflation, that's the mother of all problems, and that's what's causing all these issues. So uh, I kind of like this chart, because this chart gives an idea of what is going on in Nigeria. So if you look at money supply, you see that? You see money supply? about 50 trillion. People are always wondering, ah, there's no money in this country, but hey, that's not what the data says. We've gone from about here, just slightly over, over 16 trillion in 2020 to 50 trillion uh, in terms of money supply. And then you can see what happens when money supply goes up, inflation follows in tandem. And that's because if you're pumping a lot of money into the economy and that money is not going into productive sectors, it tends to always go into sectors that are not productive and that drives inflation up. And that's why we're in so much trouble today in Nigeria. And to react to that, the NPR has done what you can see. NPR has been flat for months until they started picking it up just so that they can bring this down because the idea is that uh, NPL should be high enough to bring down inflation. So but that's where we are. So what's going to happen inflation outlook? Uh, we think inflation is likely going to be high uh, this year. It might not rise as much as it did last year, but it's likely going to be sticky uh, for most of 2023, not just in Nigeria alone, but globally. Uh, there's fear that we might be going into a recession or even a stagflation. But latest numbers that came out a few days ago, looks like the world is soldiering on jobs, people are creating jobs. Like, in fact, I think the World Bank even advised the global economic good higher. So perhaps maybe inflation might not be that much of a problem. But in Nigeria, uh, we do think inflation will remain a problem because we haven't kicked in several subsidies likely going to kick in. Uh, Interest prices likely going to go up. Uh, we still might face exchange rate issues. So very, very likely that uh, inflation rate might still be sticky, even if it doesn't rise as much as it did last year. 
And so that is it. And of course, expect more sacrification. I'm sure a lot of you already are used to things being sold in sachet these days. And things, if you, if you get a, 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 a sachet of milk, half of it is probably empty and you realize what you have, where you don't have the milk. So expect more of this this year. All right, so Forex Outlook, uh, I like to always look at this chart because this sort of gives you an idea of what happens. So look at our crude oil sales because that's a major part of how we get Forex. And look at it, see how it's been doing lately. This is from 2013. You can see back then we're doing about $10 billion or thereabout, you know, between nine and $10 billion of crude oil sales inflow into the CBN. Uh, but look at now, see where we are. That is why you're in a senior crisis. Another number we tend to look at is capital, total capital importation. You can see uh, it used to be very high. We used to get a lot of money from foreign investors, but now foreign investors don't trust Nigeria that much. So they've all basically exited. And these two things affect the value of the exchange rate. And that is why we're somewhere here. You can see the delta uh, so is above 700 because of these issues that I have just mentioned. So what's the forest policy outlook? Uh, this current CBN is likely gonna keep going on uh, with you know controls, they're very, very, we have a very stubborn CBN. So they like to follow through with their policy. So expect capital importation to remain low. Uh, oil prices likely, uh, oil revenue might go up because of some of the things the government is trying to do. Uh, Dan with refinery might be a game changer, who knows, because if the refinery does start then, maybe we'll start to you know, buy a lot less oil and that saves us a bit more dollars. Uh, but expect the CBN to continue with its forex, forex policy. I do expect the exchange rate to depreciate this year at the official official uh, market. Uh, it should it should depreciate, especially when the next government comes in. Because if you listen to what I said earlier, the other uh, aspirants want exchange rate to depreciate. So I expect that to happen as well. Uh, and of course, um, on the black market side, exchange rate as well might depreciate slightly uh, as more Nigerians uh, start to look to import uh, things. All right, so that is it for the exchange rate. And then uh, what does this mean? If inflation, currency depreciation for everybody, for employees, it means that employees, your wages are going to likely reduce. So people are going to ask for more salary. Uh, I have staff as well. They've been asking me for increase in salary. Uh, for capital, uh, capital is going to be very expensive now because uh, this is not the right time to risk capital, to be honest, because you're going to risk capital. People who are going to give you money are going to ask for something high. Everybody wants to see profit now because the era of free cheap money is basically out of the window. This is where people want to see money that has value. Uh, land, land. These are basically factors of production, by the way. Employee, capital, land, business owners. I'm sure some of us are familiar with it. Land is going to be a bit more expensive. Real estate will be more expensive now because of inflation. And so rent, rental, uh, uh, rental costs likely going to go up as well. And of course, uh, land would also be uh, a bit more expensive because of inflation. I've got business owners, um, high inflation is, is, is a bit of a problem for, it's a bit of a challenge for business owners because it discourages uh, investment for them. And so even if they're going to make investment, they're going to make investments that they are very, very sure will provide them some level of return. So this is the impact of inflation on currency depreciation. So Nigeria's debt market, I'm just going to breeze through this because time is not on my side. Uh, you can see most of our money goes to private sector. Yes, in case you're wondering, private sector lending uh, has also shot up. And this is one of the reasons why you're seeing high inflation because there's just so much cash in this economy. And this happened because of COVID. The government wanted, uh, you know, they sort of injected a lot of capital into, into the economy just because of COVID. And uh, now this is se sectoral decision of credit. You can see where most of our credit is going to. Uh, most of it is the manufacturing, oil and gas downstream and services. So oil and gas loans, manufacturing loans has doubled since 2015. So this government has pushed a lot of money uh, to manufacturing. They've encouraged borrowing uh, for manufacturers. Of course, oil and gas has always been high up there. And now it's also gone up by 30%. This essentially is how uh, credit is distributed across Nigeria. So we do expect interest rate to keep going up because of, 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 of the CBN's monetary policy committee um, policy. They want interest rates to keep going up because they want to discourage borrowing. So this is not a good time to borrow in case you're trying to wonder what that means uh, for us. So this is the impact. So I have that. We're going to share this slide as well so that we can have it uh, for you. So economic growth, in terms of economic growth, this is where we are. Uh, Nigeria is still growing, but albeit small. Like I said earlier, you can see the charts. It's not anywhere... Uh, where we expect it to be still just above 2% or thereabout. But interesting chart I'd like to share here. This is the composition of the Nigerian economy like before and after. So this was 2016. You can see trade used to be the largest uh, portion of the Nigerian economy, about 20 trillion. Today, it is crop production at 40 trillion. Look at the crop production, basically just on more than double. And that's because, as you all know, this government has pushed solidly for 
agric, and that is why you've seen you know crop production actually go up. And then you can see trade is now number two. Construction has gone from nowhere, look at from nine position to uh, uh, third position. So construction is now at seventeen point eight trillion. Of course, we all know why. There's been a lot of money going into construction. Nigeria has a huge infrastructure deficit, and what that means is that the opportunity opportunities for construction trade. Production. Of course, telecommunications still continues uh, you know, to remain one of the dominant sectors. As much as it has dropped the notch, uh, it's still more than doubled, as you can see here, uh, from about just 8 trillion to now 15.9 trillion. And this is likely going to go up, especially when you consider 5G. So, this is basically a composition of the Nigerian uh, economy. So, we do expect uh, growth rate to still remain uh, slightly sluggish uh, this year. We hope that we can get, we can avoid a recession, but uh, with inflation this high and CBN trying to increase interest rate, there is fear that we might slip into a recession. But who knows, maybe uh, the fact that a new government is coming in might just create some kind of resurgence and then we might have avoid that. So where are the opportunities? Uh, the panel is going to speak a lot of opportunities today, but this is where I see opportunities. High interest rates and borrowing gives cash with companies money. So if you have enough cash, uh, high interest environment is always very good for their balance for, for companies with solid balance sheets, especially those who don't need to borrow. So take advantage of that. Uh, government intervention funds will slow down, but always look out for the for the sectors that the federal government is interested in. Uh, ban on imports will create uh, opportunities for locally fabricated equipment. Equipments that companies who fabricate things uh, would be in the money because of ban on imports. Of course, uh, we 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 still see increase. Uh, in demand for online purchases, so a lot more people would re rely heavily on online, uh, online, uh, uh, you know, purchases. Uh, and of course, uh, logistics. That means that for logistics companies, uh, opportunities for them, opportunities for warehousing, uh, opportunities for spare parts, huge opportunities even for software app uh, applications as well. Uh, increased security is a problem, but. Uh, that that also creates opportunities for people who are in the security sector. You're seeing a lot of people who are, you know, going into drones now and trying to have very solid, uh, you know, uh, security equipment just so that they can avoid security. So even people are even, they are different kind of like cars these days, but there's opportunity in that sector. Of course, the biggest, the biggest for me is Nigeria's youthful population. Average age, about 18, 18 years. And that means that we have a population that can drive economic growth. There's no country in the world that has the kind of beautiful population Nigeria has today. And that means that it is an incredibly big market. And that's one of the biggest opportunities I see. Also the opportunities for low price goods market. Innovators are also fully opportune. I think I was reading yesterday, Elon Musk has now said that, look, if you can do very solid Twitter trade, that's an opportunity. So there's always going to be an opportunity for content content creators. Exchange rate crisis, as much as the bad things, an opportunity for local manufacturers. And of course, increased demand and in packaging. I know, I know, I know. So those are the opportunities that I see, Mr. Otos. And um, as much as there's a lot of problem in Nigeria, there are opportunities. And these are the industries that I think would uh, we should look out for. Uh, there are a lot of them, but very important to look at these industries for 2023 and beyond. So that essentially is my presentation, Mr. Otos. I hope that I've done justice to time. And you have, Ugo. This is one of the things I look forward to whenever we have these outlooks because the Dynametrics always puts together such insightful information. And a lot of you always, every time, people, a bulk of the questions, can I get the presentation? Can I get the presentation? So I already heard you say that. You will make that available. So thank you so much uh, for that, Ugo. Very, very in-depth there with respect to letting us know um, what's out there, what's in store for us. Um, I do want to announce as far as folks who are listening over the radio that you can drop questions on WhatsApp on this number, 080-968-22595. Let me go that again, Zero, actually 0809-682-2595. So um, yeah, you can actually send out uh, questions on WhatsApp on that phone number. All right, let's get the panelists in here. I will start with um, Kalu Aja. Uh, we're going to be talking about macroeconomic headwinds and opportunities. So, Kalu, uh, again, thanks for, for, for joining us. So, Kalu, in the face of rising prices, Ugo talked about inflation. You saw it in the presentation there. How should Nigerians be investing to earn adequate returns in order to protect themselves against the headwinds that Ugo put forward? Also, uh, Kalu, do you expect inflation to remain as stubbornly high in 20? We already said he's projecting that. To, to, so do you agree there that it's going to be remaining high in 2020? And if so, what opportunities can generate safe, low-risk inflation beating uh, returns, Carlo? 
Wow. Safe, low risk investment pitting returns. Right. I don't know if those things exist, right? So if you want safety, you've got to, you can do just the safe things and not make any returns that beat inflation. But once you want to beat inflation in Nigeria, you have to take a lot of risk. Uh, let's give the numbers. Inflation in Nigeria, let's just call it a nice round 20%. Let's, what's the implication of a 20% inflation? That means to make a real return on your investments, you've got to make 21%. Just, just to make 1%, you've got to make 21%. I looked at the Nigerian stock, uh, stock market, looked at all the top stocks, the highest dividend paying stocks, right? There is none that is paying, um, should we say, above 15%. That's the Nigerian stock market. If you pick individual stocks, if you go to the market in totality, it's not going to give you 15%. Individual stock, the top paying stock is about 12.3%. That's a bank, right? If you go to fixed income, uh, right now, risk-free rate in Nigeria, if you did a one-year fixed rate, you, know, you don't want any risk. You're not going to get 5%. So in terms of if you're doing fixed income, 5%, if you're going to take risk in the stock market to get a, a return on the equity markets, less than 15%. But inflation is 20, nice round 20, 21%. So it's very difficult to make a real return if you are investing in Nigeria in, should we say, established asset classes. Property has lower yields in Nigeria, right? Commodities, maybe you could do that, but is this sustainable? Is there a marketplace that you can plug in money and say, I want to um, hedge for one year for, for 12 months and make that consistent return? So very, very difficult to find an asset class in Nigeria that you can hold on to and say, this is going to give me a good return without taking enormous risks. Uh, if you want to get a higher return on fixed income, right, there are commercial papers out there paying 12 15% and all that. But those guys have got very, very high minimum deposits. You've got to do 5 million or 10 million to qualify to get 15% in a commercial paper. So the quick answer is this. There is really no um, safe investment in Nigeria, in quote, that's going to give you a real rate of return. To get real rates of return, you'd have to take a lot of risk to either trade or to buy volatile assets or to do a combination of portfolio that could give you that return, right? To give you that alpha and possibly could then protect your money. That's the situation we have in Nigeria right now. Will inflation go up in Nigeria next year? Um, it depends on the security situation. Inflation in Nigeria is driven by food. And food in, in Nigeria is expensive because the middle belts and the food production areas are not really producing a lot of food because of the insecurity. If we can have a handle on insecurity, then the cost of food goes down. That should drag inflation down, I believe, with it. Then if we see that coming down, then it's easier to then make a real uh, rate of return on that. So uh, Rotos, the answer actually is tough out there to find a real rate of return. What should you do? Uh, group together and see if you can raise your capital and see if you can then take advantage of this commercial papers out there because the federal government market is dead in terms of yield, right? If you want to do equities, you will have like to build a portfolio. If you're a pensioner in this market, you are in big trouble because you are a fixed income guy. You can't really take a lot of risk and the options for you out there are really, really, really poor. If you are younger, it's a time for you to try to invest and try to build that portfolio and possibly stretch it all out into the future. Thank you so much for that, Carlo. And thanks. That's that's why Narametrics brings the best experts together because they give us the 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 the, the, the real the real situation and what's going on. Uh, interesting what you said about food. We saw Hugo's chart where you show where agriculture is as far as what it contributes to the economy, and yet food is so expensive because of infrastructure. Uh, thank you, Carlo. All right, let me come to Cheta Nwazi, uh, founder of uh, SPM Intelligence. Cheta, um, we're still talking about macroeconomic. Uh, headwinds and opportunities. People that are listening want to know about the opportunities. So Carlos talked about investing. Cheta, for sub-nationals, um, you have constant interactions and research across the entire country. Are you able to share which states offer Nigerians economic opportunities, uh, Cheta? There's a lot of interest in agri-tech, prop-tech, you know, and so on and so forth. So 
where are you uh, seeing and what other examples of alternate alternative investments should Nigerians be watchful for? Shut up. Um, thank you, Rutus, and good morning. Um, the answer to what states offer Nigerians opportunities is simple. All states. Um, I think the real question really is uh, what states are at the moment more in, um, investor friendly. And um, I would say that in terms of um, things like um, infrastructure, the general environment towards business, um, you, it's, it's hard to look past Lagos, of course. Um, Lagos has the advantage of being the former federal capital, the bulk of Nigeria's economic activities go, go out, go happen in Lagos. Um, then there's Ogun State. Ogun State um, enjoys the um, proximity to Lagos. Um, because of that proximity to Lagos, there's a lot of, um, uh, it takes a lot from, of spillover from Lagos. Many people live in Ogun State, areas like uh, such as uh, Ojutu, Akote, and work in Lagos. Um, and the Ogun State government, even though it has not been very linear in doing its, um, but um, it's take it's put in place policies that they have to take advantage of Lagos. So you find a lot of manufacturing now happens in Ogun states. Um, now there's Kano. Kano is the second largest um, uh, state in the country in terms of population. Um, it's historically the, the commercial center of the north. Um, and a lot of economic activity happens in Kano people gravitate towards Kano. And there was there was um, something that we did a few years ago where we went around the country basically researching the tech sector. And I was pleasantly surprised to see a lot of tech um, and tech entrepreneurship happening in Kano. Sometimes almost hidden away from, from the outside world, but it is happening. Um, um, it beats, it's when you go down south, especially towards the southeast and south-south, for reasons of geography, it's. I think it would be. It would. It would not be fair to pick one a single state there, because there's an entire cluster from Onitsha all the way to Port Harcourt that, if the road infrastructure were very good, were were excellent, or we had the requisite road infrastructure between Onitsha and Port Harcourt is an hour's drive, and in that area which encompasses Anambra, Imo. Abia and River States, that a lot of entrepreneurial activities happen. But the problem with that region is that the governments generally haven't gotten their apps together. And as a result, people tend to hide away from the governments, um, from various state governments. But there's a huge boost of entrepreneurial activity in that region. Between Lagos and Onitsha alone, it's at least $3 billion worth of trade that moves every year, which we have not yet learned how to capture. If, if we want to unleash Nigeria, we have to find a way to better integrate Lagos and Onitsha. Um, and of course, the, the fastest way is real. Then there's Akwai Bomb. Akwai Bomb, I think, is one hidden gem in this country. Akwai Bomb is a state that people tend to overlook. They've been quietly consistent since 1999. I would go so far as to say that Akwai Bomb has, been, has probably been the best governed state in the country since 1999, when you, when you zoom out and look at the overall picture. Um, they've taken advantage of the oil industry there. The road network infrastructure is very, is pretty decent by Nigerian standards. And they do a lot of things. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a huge tech community there um, in Akwaibom. Um, then going back to the North, of course, Abuja itself, um, do not a state, it's the federal capital. There's an orbit around Abuja and the, the state that has taken the most advantage of that, of, um, of that Abuja orbit would be Nasarawa. Um, it, would, it would have been nice to say Kaduna, but insecurity has really scuppered a lot of Kaduna's plans. Um, the, the, the perennial insecurity in Kaduna has limited what Kaduna could do because Kaduna would naturally be the one that would take advantage of Abuja. But Nasarawa, especially the areas around um, um, Nyanya, um, One Man Village, and all of those places are seeing a burst of entrepreneurial um, activity. People who live in those places work in Abuja and then bring money back. And uh, it's investing at the end of the day. They are spending money in their locality. So you find that a lot of um, things are happening. Now to your second question, which is um, what other opportunities? 
given the kind of um, um, shortages, the kind of um, situations that we have in the country now, I think that it's it's difficult to look beyond agricultural technology. Um, we need to figure out ways to get food to people in the country um, as cheaply and as efficiently as possible. And there are so many opportunities in that sector. Um, so that's that will be the, that will be what I would look at. Chata, thank you so much. Really, really in depth there. Thanks for shedding lights and you know spreading it across. So Kano, uh, Lagos on each needs to be linked through rail and uh, acquire bombers. I mean, they got an airline, they have an airline, airline in acquire bomb. So very, very interesting there. There are opportunities outside Lagos. So those that think Lagos is the be all and end all of Nigeria. Chata Awasi, thank you so much. Let me come to Dr. Andrew Nevin. Um, Dr. Nevin, thanks for being with us from a a GDP perspective, doctor, um, are there economic sectors that are resilient to the challenges and these headwinds that we're going to be facing in 2023? I guess what, what economic sectors, you know, should Nigeria, Nigerians uh, be looking into for investment? Real estate, as an example, seems to be a resilient sector with, you know, growth. What, how do you see it, Dr. Nevin? Thank you, Rhoda. So just great to be here. What a fantastic panel of difficult issues. I mean, not easy in our economic environment at the moment. Um, I mean, the question has different dimensions to it, right? So, I mean, one question is if you're a corporation or a wealthy individual, you know, what businesses should you be investing in? And then we've talked about agriculture and we've talked about real estate. We've talked about um, IT, for example, and that options open to you. But as an individual, of course, you face a very different situation, right? I mean, you don't have unlimited amount of capital. Uh, any individual business in, in, in venture that you try out is highly risky. I mean, I don't know if people know the numbers on tech startups. I actually live in Nigeria because I had a, a ed tech startup in uh, in China back in 2005 or 2008 that failed. And I had to go get a job and ended up coming coming to Nigeria because I needed a job. So I, it, I'm, it's hard pressed to encourage people as individuals necessarily to invest in uh, an individual business on there. And of course, as we know, investing in the in the broader market is very difficult to beat the inflation. Uh, it, uh, whether you're in the equity market, the fixed income market, you're guaranteed to be below inflation. And I think it just highlights the destruction of value in this country. I mean, we've had, uh, for the past eight years, we've had PEBEC, we have National Heroin, Dr. Jamoke leading PEBEC, but if we're really honest with ourselves, we continue to have an even, a, a very harsh, uh, business environment. In fact, it's getting harsher, it's getting more difficult because of this need for uh, the, the fiscal raising revenue growth. Companies are finding multiple taxation. There's a myth out there the World Bank puts it forward we're a low tax jurisdiction. It's simply not the case. I mean, there's at least 50 different charges that companies often face. Um, and of course, they pay the charges and they don't get much in the way of services. So I don't necessarily, even though there are opportunities for individuals, I don't want to necessarily encourage them to to, to go out and take that kind of risk. Um, of course, and there are hedges against inflation. I mean, Affex is actually to this issue of commodity pricing. Commodities is actually offering products that people can buy commodities over six months or a year, and hopefully they'll hold their value. Whether they'll give a return, it's hard, hard to say. Real estate is something that holds its value in an inflationary environment. Um, and I think the environment for real estate's really improved over the last uh, 10 years since I've been here. Uh, in terms of buying a house and perfection and the professionalism of the developers. But again, that's also risky. It's a kind of illiquid asset. What I might say to people is if you want to hedge against all these difficulties, the people that are doing very well in this country are people that invest in themselves, that invest in their own brain capital, uh, and then have, have the skill set and the brain capital that can insert themselves into global value chains. So if you are someone who is an IT worker, you can earn money in dollars now, either with a company in, in uh, uh, directly with a company or sometimes through some groups here that are setting this up on that way. To me, that's your best investment. And of course, if you go to this harsh business environment and what's effectively happening right now, and hopefully will change after the election is value is being stripped from, from the business sector. So people that took a chance, manufacturing, lost an enormous amount of money. People that took a chance, the electricity sector, lost an enormous amount of money. Agriculture, we know we need to develop agro-processing and increase the food production here. Many people who have tried it and taken the chance have lost money. But if you invest in your own brain and you're serving, uh, in, you're working in a global value chain, earning outside the Naira system, much harder for the government to strip value from you. So I would reflect on, if you think about asset classes, we have agriculture, we have the commodities, we have a fixed income, 
we have venture capital investments, we have uh, equity markets, but your brain is also an asset class and maybe the best place to invest in your brain, given the current harsh conditions in Nigeria, the brain capital class is, uh, is the highest value. Thank you so much, Dr. Levin. That is very, very you know, pertinent advice there. Invest in yourself, invest in yourself. And that's quite a story you told going from China uh, to Nigeria to when you were getting, getting started. Thank you so much, Dr. Levin. Uh, okay, now we're gonna move into excessive money supply and implications, how to protect wealth. That's what, that's what we're going. So we've gone for the macroeconomic headwinds and now protecting wealth. So let me come back to uh, Kalu Aja. Uh, Kalu, for individual investors specific to the challenge of wealth preservation, um, what are your recommendations for individuals to protect and grow their savings? And you know, are there risks uh, to what it is that the advice you're giving? Yeah, I think the, the, the word is going to be diversification, right? You don't want to put all your eggs in one Naira basket, right? So diversify currency, diversify asset class, even if you can diversify geography, that also helps a lot, right? So I would say in Nigeria, real estate tends to hold value, might not pay you a yield, but tends to hold value, right? You might not get anything on it if you just put your money in real estate uh, or even commodities like say just precious metals, like just having a gold earring or a gold watch, as simple as that sounds, you have it, if you want to sell it, it the value carries over. You're not going to get any yield on those asset classes per se, right? If you are in in Naira, it might be a good idea to perhaps diversify into other currencies. If you have the means to earn foreign currencies, i.e. if you can invest abroad, you are a minority that helps uh, in the US right now. If you can get as much as two, 3% on dollar risk-free, say in a certificate of deposit, right? Or you could do a dollar fund in Nigeria so they have Nigerians that invest in the euro bonds. You can buy into a dollar fund from Nigeria. So you are diversifying just your narrow earnings and you give yourself a bit of a hedge in terms of fixed income earnings, right? Um, other things you might want to do is just to say, listen, let's, let's start a business, right? It's very, very risky venture capital, but do something simple that people want, food, right? People want to eat, just something that you can just leave your job and start out food or bar, just something else you can invest your Naira in today and turn it around just by transactions. Something you, if you don't know what to do, uh, don't invest, right? But if you, you see someone doing something pretty well, someone is exporting, you can partner and invest in them. I know guys that pull together money and give to an exporter and they export stuff and they share the proceeds like a cooperative. Uh, trying to use the power of many is very, very important at this time. You simply have got to do more that you're doing at the moment. The risk for you is that if you are in one particular asset or one particular location and policy change happens, especially in Nigeria, it could wipe you off, right? You're one policy away from getting wiped out. A new government can come in and say, listen, we're not going to do this sort of business or that sort of business. So you want to be very, very flexible, very, very short-term in how you're investing. If you're doing uh, fixed income, I would prefer you do short-term for now till we get a new government in and you see where they are going today. You can take a much, much longer plan, right? And try to say, spread your risk by having um, more people invest with you. Have two or three or four people come together and invest so you are diversifying that risk, you are spreading that risk around. Patience, liquidity, diversification. Those are three key words I will say right now. Thank you so much for that, uh, Kalo Aja. Uh, Cheta, let me come to you. I want to ask you about the, the Jack Bar phenomenon, creating contents and uh, open AI. Uh, so Cheta, we've, of course, uh, heard of a lot of Nigerians that are migrating, right, to seek greener pastures, hence the, 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 the Jack Bar phenomenon. Of course, and Narometrics has written about this extensively. However, Cheta, not everybody can migrate, whether by choice or otherwise. So how can the average Nigerian earn more whilst remaining in this country, Cheta? And then give, give us your thoughts on content creation. We've seen a lot of folks getting popular. Does that pay? Is that something to get into? And then what other emerging opportunities are there? There's this whole buzz about open AI, chat GPT, and this emerging tech help Nigerians you know, grow their income potential. So those three points, Cheta, what are your thoughts? Um, let's start with um, the one that most directly affects Nigerians, which is the Japa phenomenon. Um, 
this this particular trend, uh, so I think it's important to point out that the area that is now called Nigeria has um, been a net exporter of people for centuries now. Um, we've and it is only in one very small window, at least in the five hundred years, that we um, we we had a reverse flow, and was, uh, between two thousand and seven and twenty fifteen, um, for the most part, we've always exported. Um, and the, part of the reason for that is structural, very structural. It means it's uh, because our economy never generates as many jobs as people to fill the jobs. So when you think of when you think of it in that respect, then you you consider that it is very possible to say that um, Japa is actually useful because it's, um, for want of a better expression, an advanced job creation program. However, the Current Japa trends has um, the, has something that has never happened before. You are seeing a lot of people in mid level positions and senior management positions leaving to essentially start life again in other countries. Um, they take with them their experience, which will be needed. A lot of what is happening within within the banking sector can be directly attributed to that. You you see a lot of um, uh, you see a lot of banks um, having um, IT problems because whole IT departments have been gutted and they don't have the experience to fill. And the education sector in the country is not generating enough experienced or skilled people to fill those vacancies. So, um, and in the short to medium term, the Japa thing will hurt us, um, especially in very highly skilled positions. At lower level positions, not so much because you don't you don't need the kind of skill sets to fill those positions. However, in the long term, it will be very, it will be, it will be, it can be a net positive. Remittances have overtaken oil as, um, as a, a revenue generator for Nigeria. People who are leaving leave families behind. And when they leave families behind, they still feel uh, something, they, there's an emotional attachment, emotional connection that the that they use the, or that is useful in terms of sending money back. And that money will be useful in building the economy. So Japa is neither good nor bad. It's, it, it will be the result of what we make of it. It's that simple. If we are able to take advantage of our increasing diaspora, um, not and not just um, that our diaspora is getting more and more influential in terms of positions that they occupy in terms of things like policy. So, as an example, we have um, a, a someone of Nigerian descent, Kemi Badenok, in the cabinets in the UK. Um, have we have has Nigeria bothered to try to engage with her to try to influence the policies of the Rishi Sunak government? Um, the, the UK has a, has a deliberate Africa strategy now, um, still, still very much in its infancy. I've seen the document and to be honest, I wasn't very impressed, but that's another discussion entirely. However, it's an opportunity. The UK just um, um, uh, uh, gave us more preferential tariffs just this week past. And a lot of it is because they need us, they need our people. So how are we? Those who are left behind in Nigeria taking advantage of these openings. Those, those, these are the questions that um, that we need to answer. Now, Chat GPT. Um, it's a new technology. I think that there's um, there's quite a bit of hype to the, to that. Um, I think that the integration of um, technologies such as Chat GPT has the potential to. Um, reduce barriers of entry for individuals and organizations that want to enter um, fields such as uh, copywriting, journalism, content generation generally. Um, and I've seen um, examples of uh, chat GPT being used to work Excel spreadsheets, um, which is a, which is a very good thing. It's, it, if, if, it's, if it's as good as they are trying to market it, then it means it will reduce the amount of time needed for analysis, the kind of work that I do. Um, having said that, it would mean that a lot of people will need to upskill and upskill very quickly. Um, AI is here to stay. Um, I don't think that AI is going to remove jobs the way people, um, especially in Western countries are afraid. I think that what will happen is that AI will um, create more opportunities, more kinds of jobs. So a lot of people need to retrain. 
But generally, for a country like Nigeria, the use of AI offers opportunities in um, education, um, training, development, and of course, innovation. Um, we need to position ourselves for that. Thank you so much uh, for that, uh, Chata. Uh, again, giving us the, the lay of the line as far as what to expect with Chat, with chat GPT and also how the jackpot phenomenon is either good or bad. It's what we make of it. Thanks, Chata. Uh, again, this is the Naira Metrics 2023 Economic Outlook. Uh, we are live on Radio Now 95.3 FM. And I just want to remind folks that you can send in WhatsApp messages. I think a number of people are actually sending in a uh, calling. So again, let me give that, that number again for, for list, those listening live on Radio Now 95.3 FM. Phone number is 0809-682-2595. So once again, 0809-682-2595. WhatsApp messages, sending your WhatsApp messages for those listening live on 95.3 uh, uh, FM. I see that Rolake Akinkube Filani has joined us. Rolake, good morning to you. Thank you so much uh, for, for, for joining us. Um, good you're, morning. You're doing th good morning. You're doing things at Mixta Africa, and it's good to have you here uh, with this on this panel. Rolake, I, I just want to get your thoughts. We're talking about opportunities um, for Nigerians. There's a lot of headwinds, macroeconomic headwinds out there. You, you know, you, you are well-versed in energy, but I want you, can you talk to, quickly just talk to us about real estate, about opportunities in real estate for those who are listening? Um, because what Carl Luaja was just talking a moment ago about how it preserves capital, right? You can preserve some capital there, but in terms of returns, eh, maybe not so much. Give us your thoughts on, as far as investment opportunities in the real estate sector, uh, Rolake. Thanks for joining me. Yes, thank you very much. So I think, you know, I've always been a firm believer that real estate is a store of value. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the things that we've increasingly looked at doing is really finding ways to make home acquisition much easier. And the typical complaint you hear is that they don't have initial enough money for that initial deposit. The value just seems too big. But there's so many innovative ways to approach it right now. So one of the really interesting trends we're seeing is fractional ownership. Um, I think that's something that's going to be a great uh, key driver of home financing this year, where you can essentially own a fraction of real estate. Um, the second thing I would say is that if you look at some of the new emerging access, so we're moving beyond, if you look at a metropolis like Lagos and you look at Leki, Ekwe, or the Ibeju access, the development of very important infrastructure along those nodes is going to see a major tick up in valuation of land. So we, for instance, in the Lagos New Town area, over the last five to six years, we've seen more than a 200% increase in land valuation. Now, the great thing about land as an asset is that you can either approach it from a speculative perspective, or you can hold it with a view to building in the future. The third thing I would say is many people, and particularly those in the diaspora, often say, well, you know, yes, they're in a much stronger position from an FX perspective when they convert to Naira, but the issue then becomes when you then want to liquidate that asset, you know, what happens to the value of the Naira? Well, I always say that real estate is just one asset class. If you're a serious-minded investor, you should take a portfolio perspective and have in mind an average return that you expect to generate from that portfolio. So I think there, there's so many ways to acquire real estate. We've launched a rent to own uh, uh, scheme, which reduces the initial barrier to entry. Um, so I would always say there are options, there are ways to look at, at it, but I think with any type of investment as an asset class, you have to look at it from a portfolio or a basket of assets perspective. I think the final thing I would say is that, you know, we often talk about the, the housing deficit. And, and I often say that it's not a housing deficit. It's really just an affordability deficit that's going on. And what we're finding now is that there are more innovative products that are coming onto the market. Uh, for instance, in the property technology space, more companies are providing different types of fintech payment options that ease the burden of putting down huge amounts of money at a time. And all of those things are going to introduce cost efficiencies into the sector, which will help the supply side, the development side, and hopefully which will then facilitate and, and drive the consumer side of it. So those are some of my initial thoughts around real estate. I'm also seeing interesting 
um, trends emerging around the metaverse and what you can do with NFTs and real estate. I will say that you have to go with your eyes open. Obviously, that you Okay, um, I disappeared, or is everyone else experiencing Rolaka? Okay, Rolaka, you froze a bit there. I think the last thing you said was that um, you should go into the metaverse as far as real estate with your eyes open, because there was a lot of hype about one particular telco company buying land in the metaverse. So just to repeat that last point, you're saying folks should be careful, right? I don't recall the last thing you heard there. So the, the you're just saying people should be careful when it comes to the metaverse and real estate. Okay. No, I think I, Maraca, I, she, just, uh, she should just continue. I think she was talking about the, you were talking about the metaverse. So just, just continue from there. real estate sector using some of those schemes. But like I said, you have to go in with your eyes open. You know, real estate is called real estate because it's talking about real physical assets. So this should be savings or money that you can use in a speculative way. I, I think we just need to do a bit more market research to understand what the long-term upside of many of those newer types of technology-driven asset classes are. Great stuff. Thank you so much, uh, Rolake, uh, Akinkube, Filani. All right, let me come back to uh, Dr. Andrew Nevin. Uh, Dr. Nevin, earlier when we we're talking about macroeconomic headwinds, you mentioned PEBEC and you mentioned, you know, that's the Presidential Enabling Business Environment uh, Council, which, as you said, was supposed to make life easier for businesses. But then you said, look, let's be honest with ourselves. Things haven't been that easy for businesses. So for Nigerian businesses, Dr. Nevin, um, how can they protect themselves in the face of challenging economic policies, um, which, you know, impact wealth preservation? We heard Carlo Ajawa said you're one policy away from being wiped out. So how do you protect yourself? Um, what are examples of stores of value accessible to Nigerians, in your view? And are there any other countries which have, you know, experienced the degree of challenges to wealth preservation that Nigerian businesses face, individuals as well? And how did they cope, Dr. Nevin? Well, an individual and a corporation are in different situations. So if you take, for example, a family-owned corporation, medium-sized family-owned corporation, I mean, it's, it's in our environment in the past decade I've been here, particularly the last eight years, uh, has been at real risk. Um, and you can have the family's wealth wiped out. So in that situation, you know, what does the family need to do? You need to take be taking out something out of the corporation while it's having its good times and putting into other asset classes that are uncorrelated. You might choose to put some of it in Nigeria, in equities market, in the fixed income market, in the real estate market. But for all the reasons we've discussed, I mean, I was a little shocked. I think I was in the country two or three years before I learned that there was a time when the pound was worth more than the Naira. So the historical experience, of course, is that the Naira is not a store of value. And so far, the evidence is if you hold the Naira exclusively, you know, you have a chance your net worth is going to go to zero. So if you are a owner operator of a small or medium sized business or a large business, it's very important that you don't have 100% of your wealth tied up in that, in that business because the policy can wipe you out. So you need to be taking money out regularly. You need to be diversifying all of the other asset classes uh, that are not re related to the Naira. So it may be commodities here, but it may also be US dollars. It could be Bitcoin. I wouldn't necessarily, I, I don't make recommendations. And I don't think anyone would certainly think they want to have a significant amount of their, their wealth tied up in Bitcoin and Ethereum. But you know, you can imagine that as an asset class as a reason why Nigerians have really embraced uh, the cryptocurrencies as a result of that. So, so again, don't have all your eggs in, in one basket. Um, and also in terms of, I mean, I can say for many of the companies that I'm doing, small companies, I'm not talking about my work at PwC with large companies, but I think people are aware that I'm an angel investor in a number of small companies from Nigeria's technology related companies. And the number one thing that happens is that people are overestimate how quickly things will happen. So if you're in the situation and they don't get to cash, you know, once you get to cash flow positive, you're in a very different space because then you can control your own destiny a little bit better. So, so I think that for people in that situation who are trying to 
build up a company, particularly a technology company that's loss making in its early period, you need to be realistic about uh, how how can you finance through to the point where it's where it's break even. I mean, often these companies fail not because they don't have fantastic ideas, whether they're in prop tech or ed tech or health tech or fintech. Uh, the reason they fail, usually in my experience, is that they run out of money before their idea kind of gains gains traction on there. And of course, I would also recommend, because I've been through this, having lost everything myself in EdTech and having to rebuild, don't put yourself in incredible personal risk with, with, a, um, a, a, with, with, a, with a technology startup. You want to go into a technology starting out, having some backup, having some savings, being able to finance it for a period of time, having a backup plan in case it doesn't work out that way. But to go into a uh, startup environment, I mean, there's so much hype about startup. We have such a respect for the people that start these technology companies in, in all the areas I mentioned. It's just fantastic, the energy level of it. And I've been supportive of this, both as a, from an ecosystem viewpoint and also individually in a few cases. But you are a significant risk and you can't put everything on, on a, a chip that says, I've heard so many entrepreneurs say, yes, other people have failed, I'm gonna succeed. And you need that kind of optimism to drive the energy, the enthusiasm to keep the, your, your, you know, going when things are difficult. But the reality is most of these technology companies fail. So if you're an individual who wants to give it a try, I think that's a fantastic idea, but do it with the realization and with a plan that doesn't put your entire life in jeopardy in, this, in the likely situation that your technology company fails. Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Nevin. Let's move to trade and exports. Very, very important topic because uh, some, you know, you know, the, the, the value of the Naira is going to be discussed here. Um, uh, Carlo Aja, let me come back to you. Um, do you see monetary policy as an appropriate driver for the required growth in Nigeria's non-oil exports, especially as the CBN seems keen to promote exports via its RT200 FX initiative, which for those that don't know, 200 billion is the goal for non-oil exports over the next, I think it's three to five years. Uh, Carlo Aja, how do you see things on that front? Yeah, thanks, Rutus. I mean, I, I spoke to a guy that exports yams and vegetables and all that to Europe, and he told me the big issue with exports in Nigeria is the, is the amount that they receive if they do the official remittances back to Nigeria. The CBN rate or the official rate is very, very low. So if he sells yams in, say, in the UK, and he pays or remits those forex back to the central bank, he gets a very, very, very low rate, right? If he simply holds the, the dollars, he can pay the fine, and he's better off. And that's the sentiment across the board. So CBN is saying, we're gonna give you guys a Naira, you know, incentive to remit the dollars in. It's still not enough for them, right? So they make much, much more, just send the commodities abroad, getting the Forex, and then taking that Forex and then doing their own business, right? That's really the situation. So just simply the monetary side, just simply say, this is the cost of money. We're gonna use that to boost exports. That might not work. That's one side of the equation. The other is just pure infrastructure. He had to move to Ghana to export yams because it's very, very tough for him to export um, through a papa, through the ports, lots of fees. You know, he does a lot of cashew as well. All the cashews that come from the east to Lagos, he's charged on official duties, levies. So his cost goes down. The infrastructure to take the stuff out of Nigeria is much more expensive. So it's easier for him literally to just go to Ghana and do the exact same, just exporting yams to the UK. So just cheap, just costing money alone, just monetary side alone might not boost export. You've got to really come down and say, why, how can we get the farmer exporting cocoa to do more of that? Like for a long time, I was in the export to cocoa because we're fumigating the containers, simple stuff like that. We don't have any marketing board that says you can't use this kind of chemicals. This is how you clean out containers to export cocoa to the EU. Simple basic stuff like this. Who is doing bulk buying? So if I'm a cocoa farmer, who can I sell to once harvested? You have some individuals that do buy, but there should be, as I suggest in any other part that has a lot of exports, a commodity board that sets prices, buys in bulk, gives you high quality seeds, high quality fertilizers and does support you. So that hard work, we haven't yet done that. So just the monetary side alone wouldn't push it, um, uh, wouldn't push non-oil exports out. Dangote is now the largest uh, non-oil exporter from Nigeria. He's exporting urea fertilizer. What a 
to ask a question is urea oil or non-oil because it's actually coming from natural gas if you take away urea what are we back to cocoa and if you look at the gap between cocoa and crude oil it's i mean it's wide so have we really closed that gap uh, between cocoa and crude oil where are the opportunities there's entertainment davido makes a lot of money all those guys that do uh, music they make a lot of money there's a nexus between music between fintech and it there's something in the Nigeria can do. We can say, listen, we can get that video to, to do the music in Nigeria. We can do a digital tag on it. And if it's exported from Nigeria, we get a share of the revenues. We can do something around there that I think we're overlooking. So maybe we can start to expand how we think about non-oil exports away from just agriculture, more into IT, FinTech and all that. Yeah. Thanks, Carlo. You mentioned Davido doing a show here. It reminds me of uh, that Burner Boy episode where he was late for his show and he complained about the equipment. He announced that he wanted to start investing in his own equipments and sound. So very, very interesting there. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Carlo. Uh, Cheta, how can Nigerian businesses tap into the increased push for exports to earn more FX? I, I mean, McDonald examples have suggested exporting you know, but Carlo, as you just mentioned, cocoa, for example, exporting agricultural products, you know, we continue to present untapped opportunities. Just how do you see it? How do you how do businesses tap in? Well, first, first, we have to improve quality. Um, in June 2017, we made a lot of noise about exporting yams to the EU. Um, what a lot of people uh, did not hear was the follow up, which, which was that the yams were quietly returned because they didn't meet up to. Um, EU quality. Basically, we need to improve quality. Um, once we improve quality, people will come. Um, uh, Carlo said that um, we that agricultural products are um, our largest um, export outside the oil sector. I beg to disagree a bit. I think that content, and um, people tend to get about things such as content. So, um, Nollywood, um, Afrobeats, even skits, comedy contents, their services, but they are huge exports. They are, they are huge exports, um, source of export revenue for Nigeria. And people come to them because people like the quality. It's that simple. So when your quality improves, people will come. You don't have to go about begging people to come once you have the quality. The, the, the market for contents is getting, is getting crowded, but it's one of those. Um, markets that even though it appears crowded, you, there's always still space for more. More creators are vying for market share. Um, and they are actually pushing traditional um, agencies out of the out of the space. Um, there was this, a there was a graphic that was published recently that showed that um, a comedy skit maker earns uh, I think four million dollars last year from YouTube thereabouts. That shows you the that shows you the potential in terms of what can happen. Now, when it comes to hard stuff, um, we, we can start looking at things like um, manufacturing. And this is one place, one place where we are not uh, doing well. We're not taking advantage of our proximity to Europe, as an example. There's really no reason why a country such as Bangladesh should be making, uh, should be the source of apparel to Europe, while we are, what, six hours away by air from Europe as compared to Bangladesh, but it comes down to that thing, quality. What is the quality? Why should we have a situation where people who want to export yams to the UK have to go to Ghana to export yams? For the simple fact that those yams may get rotten sitting in a paper pot for months. So we actually need reform on our own side with, um, with respect to the custom services, for example, the people who check. Yes, they need to improve efficiency in terms of checking to make sure that quality is met, but they also need to learn to get out of the way. And I think the first step towards that is um, having a situation where customs, for example, is decoupled from being a revenue generating agency. Because we, we give customs all these revenue targets, rather than focusing on doing the actual work of customs, they are focused on raising money. And sometimes what we need to understand is that the roadblocks that they put in the way of either exports or imports is their own way of trying to meet those unrealistic targets that we set for them. So we need a lot of reform. 
um, in a, a lot of reform in our own processes in order to actually begin to unleash our true potential. And of course, one thing that I always uh, shout about is we actually need to move a lot away from just the legal sports. Thank you for that, uh, Cheta. Rolake, for real estate and for on the developer side, we are still, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, are we still in, import dependent on building materials? Uh, has that turned the corner? Is there, good, is, there, is there going to be a time where um, other nations will depend on ceramics, the tiles, all these things are involved in for developers? Are, are, is, are we still at a deficit there, Rolake? Um, what's, what's the outlook as far as trade and exports for you know, real estate is concerned? Well, that's a really interesting question, which I wasn't expecting, but, but very fascinating of you to ask, actually. Um, I think it really depends on the market segment you're in. We do residential and what we call middle income and high income. And we're finding that we're still extremely import dependent on even the middle income and high income segments of the market, particularly for fixtures and fittings. Obviously, we can localize much of our cement uh, use here, localize the value chain, because it's also a corporate defense mechanism for most developers, because you're not as exposed on the FX side if you're able to do that. Um, but I think on the um, affordable end of the market, there's a lot more we're trying to do locally. And actually, when it comes to development, it doesn't just start from the foundation. Uh, I'll give you a very interesting insight. We need, we do a lot of sand filling in our country. So and especially because we're building, we're reclaiming, you know, land from the ocean. So we're building in places that historically have not had hard soil. So once you've done your soil analysis, a lot of that land is going to be sand filled. And guess what? Many Nigerian developers have to import sand from the West Africa sub-region. Um, this is something that a lot of people don't know. So actually, the cost buildup for a typical infrastructure developer in the real estate uh, space starts from right when you are even sand filling your land before you do the piling and the foundation, which is one of the reasons that we're facing huge rises in home build costs, which then trickle on to the consumer. So I guess the question here is, we need to do more to localize the value chain. And there are advocacy groups that are trying to do that. I think it's better to import from within the region than to try and bring it from outside the region. So long as intra-Africa trade makes sense, you're still keeping value within the West Africa sub-region, but it is no longer, it's an unsustainable way to go. And then if you move further up the value chain, um, what we're seeing is that we're, we're localizing much more of the service element of, um, development. So in terms of the engineering, the architecture services, the, the MET services, you know, the engineering mechanical, all of that is being more localized, which makes it much more cost effective. But I think the main killer here is the financing of development, right? Real estate sector, if you look across broadly, the infrastructure landscape, it's been one of those sectors that has fared poorly insofar as attracting long-term low-cost capital, uh, because you're talking about developments that take a long time to come to the market. And once they're on the market, the cash flow forecasts are over three, four, five years in some cases. Um, and so that is going to be a major driver. If we can unlock low-cost capital for the sector, rather than relying on short-term commercial papers, which will hemorrhage any typical real estate business, that's one way to go. So we need to see more incentives. Uh, we need to see more localization of raw materials. Uh, we need to see a much more efficient and effective land tenure system in the country. And we also need to see the, you know, one of the complaints we've had, certainly in our industry, is that developers see all these assets, mostly historically government owned, which are line fallow, which could be converted into housing that meets the need. Um, so I think we need to do a lot more to have those conversations with the public sector to see that sector grow. Um, and then th the final thing I would say really on the issue around taxes and revenues, I, I think we need to focus more on how we boost productivity through the investment in infrastructure rather than wait till the businesses who are already struggling, you know, export their goods or sell their goods and then you tax them. If a lot starts and happens right at the, at, at the level of the factors of production, then businesses become naturally more productive 
are earning way more, their profitability levels are up and they don't feel the pinch as much from a tax perspective. So I think sometimes we put the cart before the horse and a lot more needs to be done when businesses are actually building from the ground up, ground up. Thank you so much uh, for that, Rocket. That's that's crazy. I didn't know that. So we're, we're, we're importing sand. Um, Dr. Nevin, uh, let, let, let me bring you in here. Um, as far as your views on factors that are, you know, against, you know, building up against uh, headwinds against Nigeria's non-oil export value, like, like cocoa, for instance, Dr. Uh, Carlo, I was talking about cocoa a lot. Like, how do we go from cocoa to chocolates, right? And be part of the, that multi-billion dollar industry as far as finished goods. Just, I want to get your thoughts on boosting non-oil exports, Dr. Well, I mean, we put our paper out just before Christmas, and I think our PwC view is pretty clear. I mean, and I think some of the panelists have mentioned this. I mean, it is not feasible in the medium term for Nigeria to be competitive in physical goods, maybe one or two or three agricultural commodities, but it's uh, anything physically produced. And, you know, what's the reason for that? We all, the port system, the custom service, the excess charges, I mean, all the evidence is there and no one is going to be prepared to invest in producing physical goods in Nigeria. Nigerians aren't prepared to invest. Outsiders aren't prepared to invest. The only feasible strategy for us to boost non-oil uh, exports is in the services. Now, I think a lot of people have a misconception. Two thirds of the world's economy is in services. Services are actually the big part. They're the, they're the dog. They're manufactured goods, physical goods are the, are the tail in effect. And we should be exporting services. And we've already talked about exporting Hollywood, exporting music, exporting fintech. I mean, you've got companies, banks like Access, UBA on the march across Africa, for example, but also out exporting software development services, exporting uh, BPO, business process outsourcing. I'll cite Amal Hassan's company. I mean, she's a national heroine. She's got 1,500 employees that do outsource services for her company, uh, Outsource Global, based here in Abuja and Kaduna. Uh, they're all earning good wages that she's bringing in foreign exchange into this country. That needs to be expanded. And we put it in our paper, we think we could do you know, 2 million people over a period of time. I was just in Bangalore in India. Of course, India started its a very similar way. It was not in a position to be able to export physical goods in the 1990s. They had a financial crisis, the IMF came in they airlifted their gold to Geneva to back their IMF loan. And then they started to export services and Bangalore is the center of it. So I was just in Bangalore last month or sorry, in December. Uh, and they have 2 million young people working in the global IT industry. And it's an extremely prosperous place. But the other reason that we put forward that services are a, a better bet for Nigeria, one, we can actually do it because we don't have to rely on the port and all the reasons we cited. But two, exports are higher value added. So if you think about Apple for a moment, the software engineer for Apple earns a six figure US dollar sal salary. The manufacturing individual in the Foxconn plant in Guangzhou, China is earning a four, a four digit US dollar salary. Which job do we want to have in Nigeria? We're perfectly capable of having the higher value added job. I mean, you look at the success of Nigerians around the world in the diaspora and you look at the high value we produce. And I will end this, uh, this part of it by saying actually that most valuable export, and I count them as Nigerian, the most valuable export that Nigeria has ever produced is Giannis Adetokounmpo, the center for the Milwaukee Bucks, who's essentially a billion dollar franchise. So you know, we can produce extremely high, high value services from this country in many, many different areas. Let's continue to produce the Giannis Adetokounmpo's, whether they're in software, business process outsourcing, FinTech, music, and of course, football. I'm a big fan, I'll say it right here, of Taiwo Awani on Nottingham Forest. I think he's gonna be a fantastic success. So Nigeria should be exporting services, not trying to do manufactured or physical goods. Point well made. Thank you, Dr. Nevin. Thank you, Dr. Nevin. All right, we move to another sector, uh, another session here on the key decisions in 2023, the big one. But well, it's funny, if I say the big one, I wonder what people think about. Do they think of Naira scarcity or fuel scarcity or debt? But this is debt. Um, securitization of ways and means and ending petroleum subsidies. You saw Ugo Dre's presentation at the beginning. What is it, 22 trillion that we've been, the federal government has been borrowing from the CBN, not part of the, the DMO's um, makeup of Nigeria's debt. So let's uh, get into it. Um, going back uh, to uh, Kalu Aja. Kalu, what are your thoughts on the proposed securitization 
of the ways and means, um, and hope maybe you can explain what securitization means for our, the folks that are uh, that are uh, tuning in. Um, and does it free up the CBN to repeat the same issue? Does it create investment opportunities? Um, you know, as far as I guess turning it into a bond. So if you can explain securitization and then what you think you know could happen if the uh, National Assembly approves and we move forward with that, Carl. Yeah. Um, so more or less, we the CBN gave the federal government an overdraft, but the overdraft letter hasn't been signed. That's what's going on. So the whole concept of securitization is to say we want someone to sign a check. So we gave them money, but no check was signed. So essentially, they want to go back and sign a check so we can give them the money. Oh, that's that's really what it is, what's going on. But the unfortunate thing seriously is this, right? We've spent 23 trillion. This amount, if you convert it to dollars, is higher than our foreign reserves. We've spent it already. There is no proposal to spend, it's been spent. So we have to pass that, um, we have to convert that debt to a bond. We have to, because you just can't leave it on the CBN's balance sheet. It has to be recognized somewhere somehow and cbn clearly can't carry it to entry they can but they do they, they, they shouldn't want to and all that so it's got to be passed eventually after the elections they will have a session they're going to pass it that's what they're going to do so going forward what should we do about that whole process tighten it up make it very very clear the laws are very very clear this is just malfeasance from the guys that were in charge the, the national assembly and the cbn they were derelict in their duties and they allowed this to happen so what can we do going forward. I think we should sell some assets. There's um, the natural gas is right out there. Sell something, maybe 5% of that and pay down the principal of our foreign debt, the euro bonds. Either we do a repayment, we, we buy back the bonds or we pay down. Right now, there's a discount. Sell five or 10 of Nigerian liquid natural gas, pay off the euro bond side. The problem is euro bond because it's in dollars and it's about 8.5%. The Naira debt is we've reduced NPR, right? Maybe we can refinance those debts. But the dollar one, we can't print dollar and we have to earn dollar. So we don't earn the dollars we earn, we're paying fuel subsidy, they say. So we have no dollars to um to service any debt. So I would think long term, do some asset sales, cut down on the spending, pay off the euro bond side. And I think it's gonna be what the next president is gonna do. But that's what's gonna happen, more or less. Thank you so much for that, Carlo. Fuel subsidy is also part of this session as well. It's not just uh, debt. So, uh, Cheta, let me ask you about, as far as the subsidy is concerned, what are the possible options available to the coming administration to build a sustainable oil and gas sector that is able to attract foreign inflows? And Cheta, I also want you to, to, to factor in this whole shift to renewables, energy transition, or you know, oil and gas majors moving, you know, so on and so forth. So, Cheta, how does that all fall in in your outlook for the oil and gas sector if you're advising whoever comes in? Well, the petrol subsidy has to go. There's there are no two ways about it. Um, unfortunately, I don't think it will go. Um, I think that's number one. There are too many entrenched interests um that's will that will prevent it from going you can see how the current uh, the, the outgoing government kicks the can down the road with respect to the petrol subsidy um the so there are two things that will stand against the removal uh, a complete removal of the petrol subsidy number one the fact that the, there are so many entrenched interests so many vested interests in it and number two the fact that nigerians as a people are addicted to cheap petrol um, and one thing that we need to understand is that an addiction is something you don't throw it out of the window. You beg it to go downstairs one step at a time. What would work is a phased removal of the subsidy over, over the four-year cycle of the next administration. Um, and if the administration can be committed to it, and can get the right messaging so that Nigerians will understand and above all be transparent about where the savings go to. Unless, unless we have those convergence of factors, we will be, we'll still be sitting here in four years time saying the same thing and complaining about the petrol subsidy. Because the moment you try to remove it 
one hand, cold turkey, you will see a pushback. There will be social unrest. Um, we're already seeing those signs of social unrest um, in that it's not just in other sectors. Now, which re, um, with regards to the oil industry, the oil industry, there's, there's, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. First, cleaned up. Um, we've unfortunately let our oil industry come to a point where there are so many players inside who are not, and I'm being, being very careful here now, there are so many players involved who are not registered for want of a better word, but they've become entrenched in the system. That um, nine kilometer pipeline uh, fiasco from the end of last year was just, it was just a symptom of a larger problem. And um, it will take a lot of will to actually end this problem. But Nigeria cannot uh, see serious profit from an oil industry again as long as this problem persists. Um, and it's, it all boils down to state capacity and whether the Nigerian state is actually in control of, um, of its entire territory. It is not spoiler. Um, so that's it, for, that's it for the oil industry, for the petrol subsidy. Um, you asked about renewables. Um, there's, a, there's an emotional commitment to renewables in the, in the Western world um, that is not going to go away. Um, uh, there was a time that um, I said, I visited Amsterdam and I saw the, the sheer number of bicycles and then electric cars um, told me that this is, this is the trend now. The ironic thing or the interesting thing is that we also have as a country, um, we have some of the uh, resource, the minerals that are used for building renewables, uh, especially in the middle belt. For me, that brings a key worry. We have perfected a system in Nigeria where we basically move on to the next resource, extract, do not add value to it, and simply sell at and then use, use that to service a very narrow end. Um, it was palm oil before crude oil. And I have a fear that that is what will happen with the minerals necessary for renewables. Um, we need to learn how to start adding value in our own, uh, in our own within our own space um, before exporting to the world. Otherwise, we will keep having these cycles of Current wealth that doesn't trickle down to everybody, and then social unrest. We are heading to the end of such a cycle with crude oil. Um, and the question becomes are we going to have simply go into another cycle when we have refused to exploit the resource that is that we really have that is necessary, which is human resource? Thank you so much uh, for that, uh, Chet. Uh, uh, Rolaka, let me, let me bring you in as well. Um, do you think, Wolake, that the planned removal by June of this year of subsidies will help drive stability in Nigeria's oil and gas downstream sector? And who do you think will be the immediate and long-term uh, beneficiaries, Wolake? Um, Well, first of all, you know, operative word being planned. I don't think that removal will happen happening in June, because I, I don't think any government that comes in in May is going to be in a position to take a fully informed decision as to removing something as monumental as subsidies in the space of a month. So I don't think it's going to happen at the deadline. But, and the answer to the second part of that question is no, I don't think it's going to be the, the panacea for the woes that the downstream oil sector is facing. One of those big woes is just you know, look at our road network. Let's look at how the infrastructure network for transportation of petroleum products is currently laid out in the country. There's still major bottlenecks around the country that need to be solved. Um, the other issue is we need to, first of all, also stabilize the exchange rate. So the issues around the macroeconomic and the monetary policy, actually, in my mind, those also need to be, it needs to be a two multi-pronged approach, if you like, um, and then thirdly, the, the other thing I will say is that with reference to, I think it was Cheta or Kalu that mentioned the issue of entrenched interest. I think that is the big factor which is currently being underplayed. 
And I think one of the reasons it may be underplayed is nobody really understands, you know, the full workings of how the entire system really operates. So I think it's not going to be a panacea. What actually needs to happen, if you look at it, is Nigeria now needs to take the issue of having a diverse energy mix seriously. Um, and that needs to come hard and fast. One of the compelling rationales right now for renewable energy is the diesel price and the cost of servicing off-grid generators across the residential, SME, or commercial and industrial space. That is a major factor. How can we build and innovate in such a way that, yes, some people will still be dependent on petrol and diesel, but at least you reduce that level of dependency by investing and incentivizing investment in alternative forms of supply and energy. Interestingly, I was speaking to a, a local oil and gas CEO recently who was telling me that one of their flow stations offshore is being powered by solar. That will eventually have to be the reality. Now, they could well power it by diesel or gas-fired uh, 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 a system, but they had opted for solar because in the long term, you know, from an OPEX perspective, it's much more cost effective. So I think whilst we're looking at the issue of how do we remove the subsidy without causing major upheaval across the economy, because I think that's a risk, we should also be looking at a more proactive approach to investing in alternative forms of solar. Now, um, hydrocarbons are not going to go away anytime soon and, and not for many, many decades to come. But surely we have to move to a much more efficient energy system for, for Nigeria's economy. Um, and the, the final thing I would really say is that we need to invest in the infrastructure network across the country. Transportation, if you look at the price buildup for the typical petrol or diesel per liter, transportation and infrastructure are huge driving factors of cost. And so we need to try and solve that problem. There's no reason why in a fully liberalized market, and I've said this many times, that the current cost of petrol or diesel will not eventually come down because once you introduce efficiencies into the market, there's competition, there's full liberalization. There'll be so much competition that everybody will be fighting tooth and nail to ensure that they provide the best service to the end consumer. So it's going to be a lot of pain and before results, but I think we have to do it at some point. Thank you so much, uh, Rolake. Dr. Nevin, I, we have to get your thoughts on debts, the ways and means, and fuel subsidies. Doctor, please go right ahead. Years that Nigeria doesn't have a debt problem, um, and we disagree with the finance minister that it doesn't have a revenue problem, it has a growth problem. Um, so we've said that if we continue on a trajectory where we had growth that was anemic and basically below population growth, so we're getting poor per capita, at some point we come to a debt crisis. And you know, maybe we're at that point, we're, we're at that point now. I mean, when we have the economy growing at two and three percent, and now we have a situation where the government is becoming more predatory over the last couple of years towards business and individuals and extracting value. I mean, it's a very difficult situation. If we were growing eight or ten percent a year, you could have tax revenue going at fifteen percent a year, and it would be much more. Uh, you know, that system works, and what we have right now is not working. But we continue to say it's a growth problem, and you know, people don't want to invest in this country for all the reasons that we understand, and hence we're we're not growing. So I think we're kind of in a in a, in a real kind of uh, crisis mode. But I mean, the next government could take policies to fix it. But in terms of the ways and means specifically, I mean, our view is pretty simple, is that you know, transparency in your debt affairs it benefits the nation, it benefits your international standing. I mean, we'd like to see that the, the debt taken off of this opaque system between the CBN and the federal government of Nigeria securitized in this way, and we can move forward and have an accurate, the DMO can be publishing an accurate number of, of the debt situation on that. But, you know, we need the growth. Otherwise, we're going to continue to have, have these problems on that. I mean, with the FOIL subsidy, I mean, we've always been of the view the FOIL subsidy needs to, to go. We said that years ago. It's grown into essentially a monster that's consuming the nation. I mean, the number we're see quoted now in the public domain is six trillion naira. I mean, you think about the impact and you take the acid strike, if I understand the numbers, and I think maybe there's naira metrics the, the, where I read the best report on this, there's about uh, two trillion naira that there was the maximum demand from acid. 
and yet we're spending six trillion naira on the foil center in an incredibly opaque way. It's effectively a system of corruption. It's not a it's not a subsidy for the bottom of the pyramid in any way. If we wanted to subsidize the bottom of the pyramid, we'd simply transfer ten thousand naira on their feature phones e naira to their their e naira account, and that of course would drive the utilization of the e naira. So the government effectively is not really interested in what's happening at the bottom of the pyramid. There are certain elements that it's a little opaque to me as an outsider who are benefiting from the current subsidy regime. And our view is the sooner it goes, it goes the better. And really, I mean, I'm not a huge fan of people who followed me over the years. I'm not a huge fan of the market system in general. I am of the view that there are cases where the market system works very well, and there are other cases where it doesn't. But in the case of downstream oil and gas, downstream petroleum products, I mean, you look around the world, this is one of the easiest industries. You let market forces work and gasoline is delivered all over Europe. It's delivered all over North America. It's delivered all over Australia. It's very, very simple product to make. Refining, refining actually is not much value added. And it's a very simple product to move. It's a well understood uh, economic product. And if we just let market forces work, having multiple players in there, as Malaki said, you know, we're going to end up with a very efficient system. So, you know, we're not keen on kind of delaying the, this move. I mean, there's no budget passed uh, June for the foil subsidy. Maybe the next administration prepared to put another you know, three or four trillion in for the half year on that. But as I said, this, the number has now got to the size it's consuming the nation. If it's more than the total amount of, I understand correctly, spent on health care education and social services by the federal government. So how is it possible to have you know, that consume everything? And of course, it then has a knock on effect in driving up interest rates, because if the government wasn't borrowing for the foil subsidy, um, then the interest rates would decline. And that would save them money on, and of course, we know that interest consumes almost the total amount of revenue raised by the government. So for all those reasons, you know, it's come to an end. And just the nature of its end is kind of what's in in play right now. I mean, obviously, I mean, I think it was Bismarck who said it best. He said, the powers that be are somewhere in the five stages of denial of death around the currency regime and around the foil subsidy. These systems are dead. They're, the, they're forms of corruption. They're benefiting a small number of Nigerians. They're coming to an end. And the people who will benefit are in denial. And of course, they're going to extend them as long as possible. But the systems are over. And sometime in, I used to say, six months to three years, you know, now I'll say six months to two years, the foil subsidy will just go away. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Nevin. Uh, so that brings us to the end of our, our, our sessions our, that we've broken down. But I would like our panelists to please, for each of you, we've got a number of uh, questions in the chat box uh, below. So you can actually, for our panelists, respond to, um, to uh, the questions that are there. So let us, there's questions for all of you. And as usual, we always get a lot of questions um, for our panelists. So uh, let, let me let me start here. Uh, Carlo Adi, let me throw this question to you here uh, from Shay. Shay says, I, I have much savings in US dollars and I'm a resident in Nigeria. When is the right time to convert back to, now Shay writes Nigeria, but I think what Shay means is Naira. So when is the right time to convert back to, to, to Naira? I think is what Shay's question is. Uh, Carlo, what do you think? Yeah, is it, if it's just to hold, I would just say hold it in dollars, right? Invest it in dollars. If you want to spend uh, three to six months of your expenses, convert to Naira. But I would prefer if you already have the dollars to hold it in dollars, right? And just hold that back. Uh, that's what I would say. If the Naira rises, that's fine. If it falls, that's fine. But if you already have the dollars, you're already earning dollars, then why, why convert? If you want to spend in Naira, go ahead and do that. But if you already have it, if you're already earning that currency, that's fine. Invest in that currency, uh, spend in Naira. That, that's how I would look at it. So the question is, okay, where, where should he invest the dollars? Like I said, in Nigeria, you could invest in money market funds that accept dollars, or you could just, if you have the means to go abroad, if you have a social, you can invest abroad. They are fixed income right now. The yields are doing better today. They might change tomorrow. So if you lock in anything fixed income dollar, you get something really good and be two, three percent in dollar terms, which is not bad. So that's what I'll say. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Kalu. Uh, Cheta, this is from Muli Ridwan. Cheta, Muli is asking how to earn money from content uh, creation. I think you, you said something about content creation, how we're exporting so much. You gave a figure of one comedian who had made X amount. How do you actually make money? Is it by growing your followers to where you can now advertise products? Or how, how do you make money from content creation, uh, Cheta? It's a mixture of both. I mean, if you have a, if you have the right number of followers, you would see you would find that um, 
advertisers will come to you. Um, various content platforms such as YouTube, for example, have um, they, they sell advertising. So if you have, for example, if you have a video that goes viral, you will definitely make a lot of money from it. Um, one of the frustrations that people like us that produce serious content tend to have is that we produce, and I'm sure you see it on Arise News, for example, you produce something very serious and then um, you get you get views in the hundreds. Um, that's that's very difficult to monetize. But then you see a skit maker, um, for example, say Mr. Macaroni, and he, he puts out something and he has views in the hundreds of thousands. Now that will be paid for because before each video runs, there are advertisements that run, run a lot uh, before the video runs. And there's a, there's a revenue share formula, which um, I can't say off head. So that's just one example. But there are various ways to put out. There's Nebula, there's uh, there's Patreon. Once your content is good, people will be you will find that people will be willing to pay for it. Thank you for that, Cheta. Uh, Rolake, this one is for you. Uh, this is from GD Pratt uh, JP. Uh, Rolake, what can we do to drive single-digit mortgages in Nigeria? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm in this boat. Single digit, I want single-digit mortgages, Rolake. How do we get there? Okay um you know i'm a big advocate of it. i have this three l's of infrastructure financing low cost long term local currency but seriously there is a single digit mortgage actually there's just one single digit mortgage but that's a government backed mortgage that's the national housing fund uh which is backed by the federal mortgage bank of nigeria which is a one time access so if you pay the 0.2 percent or whatever it is by payroll you have access to this national housing fund mortgage at six percent but obviously, those, those funds are obviously uh, giving to the PMIs, the primary mortgage institutions, by the, by the government, right? That's why it's single digit. You're not going to get single digit commercial mortgages. Um, I just don't see how that will happen. One way it could happen is if the source of funds, maybe via some sort of on-lending structure, is coming from a DFI. But even DFIs, by the time you add the cost of capital, the transaction costs, even those mortgage, and there's a new one that's being uh, sponsored now by InfraCredit, the, um, um, I've, I've forgotten the name now, it's an InfraCredit backed uh, mortgage fund, um, but even that is around 10%. So I think the issue really isn't so much the single digit nature, it's just the overall is and cost, the ease and cost of financing your home purchase. And there's so many other things. So if it's not single digits and it's in the low teens, 11, 12%, but you can then get it over a longer tenure, then that should be a pretty manageable mortgage. Again, all of these factors are very peculiar to the profile of the borrower and that assessment will be made at the point of issuance of the loan. So I think my, my final answer that to that is, let's not focus so much on the 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 the, the level of, of the financing as opposed to the totality of the ecosystem around actually obtaining a mortgage you know apart from the pricing it's a tenure and and pricing is as a function of availability and the cost to the lender of those funds so it's a more existential macroeconomic question uh, that is hinged on so many other things how do you bring down the overall cost of capital in the economy. Um, but like I said, you know, there's so many other ways now to acquire your home. Uh, we rolled out a scheme that means you only pay 5% of the initial home amount. It's a rent to own scheme. And then you save over a three year period with a view to eventually acquiring the home at the end of that period. Um, it has a built in interest rate that obviously tracks inflation and takes into account the time value of money. But again, it helps to ease some of the traditional pains that borrowers typically experience from the traditional mortgage market. So if you're looking for a, a single digit mortgage, you may have to move countries. Sorry, I hope that was, <laughs> if it's not, it's probably very reassuring, but yeah. That. All right, thank, thanks for that, Rolake. Again, you know, very honest uh, answers here from everyone. All right, uh, Dr. Andrew Nevin, a lot of people, I'm seeing a question from Bumi. Uh, who was the other? Okay, this is anonymous. Everyone's fascinated, Dr. Nevin, about your 
point on services being the biggest export from Nigeria. I think so one comment here said Dr. Nevin gave an example of an Asian country. I can't remember what, con what country that was or what services, but Dr. Nevin, they, they, people want practically to know how we can actually earn money from services and how it's the way forward. And maybe if you, I don't know what Asian country you gave as an example, if you can repeat that as well, Dr. Nevin, on service exports. Hi, sorry. I hope I'm not upside down. The camera keeps switching as I turn it on and off. But I mean, India exports over $200 billion worth of services. So if we proportional to the population and we have as many capabilities here as in uh, the Indians, um, we should be exporting or 30 billion, $35 billion worth of services. I cited outsource global as an example. I mean, what's fascinating about this is that it's happening both at the corporate or organized level, but also at an individual level. Everyone on this call today knows someone that is working for a foreign company sitting in Nigeria. So that is an export of Nigerian brains when the brain stays in Nigeria and they're earning FX euros or dollars. And every meeting I go to where we discuss this, someone says, oh yes, my niece is doing this, or I know someone is doing this. And there are amazing stories about how Nigerians are inserting themselves in global value chains. So someone reached out to me on LinkedIn, a young man from Kano, we connected. Turns out he's doing AI work for a Canadian telecoms company uh, on that. He's paid in US dollars. I got in touch with him. He told me a story, as an individual, not through a company, as an individual, he works on a condo for this Canadian telecoms company doing high, very high end work. So I had him tell me his story, how he got involved in that. He's able to buy his parents a house. He's earning good living. He's bringing FX into the country. I mean, that's what we need to multiply by thousands. And of course, this is not something that governors, some governors know it. So Governor Obaseki, His Excellency Governor Obaseki, has an explicit strategy of 35,000 developers training in Edo State that can earn foreign exchange for Edo State. Uh, that's already started. There are some, some number of them, I think 500, if I understand correctly, that are actually already employed. And he's going to scale that. So if you think about the 2 million number that we put out in our PwC paper, and one governor wants to do 35,000, if every state went the same way, it would, it would, we would be part of it. I mean, there's 42 million developers needed in the world in 2035. There's 28 million currently we should be having at least one-tenth of the new developers that are required in the world. So that's 14 million new developers. And we, given our population, our young people's population versus other nations should have at least a tenth of that. That's 1.4 million people. And that's the obvious strategy because you don't need heavy capital investment. You don't need heavy uh, um, power, uh, industrial power. You need some power, but that power is small enough to be done by solar. You need connectivity, you need bandwidth, you need upskilling of young people, but to put a young person into a global value chain is less than $5,000. Each job at the Dangote refinery required $300,000 worth of capital, and there's no refined product coming out right now. So for, you know, the obvious economic answer to our challenges is we export services. And it's, as I said earlier, bigger than exporting goods anyway. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nevin. There are so many questions. Uh, we posted everyone's Twitter handles already. So if you want to you know, follow the, our panelists and ask them additional questions, then you can. I want to drag Ugo Dre in here. Ugo Dre is our stock market expert. So I got this question. Ugo Dre, since we're almost out of time, maybe you can add this to any final remarks if you have any. But again, guys, follow Narametrics, narametrics.com. Uh, at Narametrics on Twitter, uh, Instagram, social social media, social media panels, and let and networks, and then we put everybody's um, links there if you want to add additional questions because there's so many questions coming in. But Ugo, this was an anonymous one; it was thrown to the panel, so I don't know if you want to take a stab at it. What are the major developments to watch out for in the Nigerian stock markets in 2023? Um, is it dividend season, uh, March, April, or is it uh, they're saying a Dangote IPO? Uh, Ugo, do you want to take a stab at that? Um, I mean, I think the the, the guy who, who asked the question had the answers as well. Uh, yes, dividend season. So dividend season has started already, February, March. Uh, watch out for results uh, that are going to be coming out. Uh, I think that uh, a lot of companies are, are probably going to have a fairly you know, worse result compared to last year because of challenges we had uh the economy particularly ffcgs uh but the sort of the sort of uh, numbers you saw with mtn expect that for airtel as well telcos are coming out strong uh we also see expect strong numbers from the likes of dangote cement and some manufacturing companies are doing well agri-based companies as well are doing well so if you really want to go into the stock market it's, it's 
probably around December, January, or you're just about at the last end of when you should be getting it. Because what tends, tends to happen is that people like to go in when prices are now going up. And then when prices now go up and you go in, and then you now want to sell, you sell low, and then you start to worry, you start to complain that this stock market itself, I'm always losing money. So I think it's better to go in a little early. Now, another thing to watch out for as well might be the elections. Uh, uh, you know, around the elections period, I think investments kind of slows down because people, uh, you know, will be on the sidelines, pushing a lot of their money into real estate, waiting to see what happens. And that might be another opportunity to go in uh, because just as people are scared, uh, you should, you know, start to take position. Uh, I think bank stocks are likely going to take a few beating uh, this year uh, as well because of you know some of the policies of the central bank. Uh, we saw that happen last year before there was a resurgence. So you might you might see those sort of cyclical moves again. So uh, all well and good. I, I think now is probably the best time when towards the end of getting in uh, because of the earnings season and those who want a position for dividend don't buy stocks when they announce dividend. You have to buy it before then uh, because uh, you start to now, you know, you have a race uh, against a lot of other people who are also looking to invest. So that will be my guide. All right. And we are bang on time. Uh, I don't know where the time goes. Uh, two whole hours just flew by. And um, the questions, it always happens with this narrow metrics webinar. We always get so many questions. I believe um, a recording will be available because a lot of folks are asking for the recording. We're still getting more questions on Ugo Dre's presentation at the beginning. Ugo said that that would be available. We're still getting questions for all our panelists. Uh, their um, Twitter handle, um, uh, social media handles have been shared. Um, all the advice you heard Ugo Dre just give right now, nairametrics.com. I use Nairametrics for my shows on television and radio because there's so much information there. So do follow on uh, Nairametrics across all their social media channels. And uh, Ugo, that, the, is the SSN thing still there? Are, or is that, what, what's this? Are, yeah, it's coming back. Is that still coming available? Back. Coming back. Coming back. It's coming back. Okay. It's coming okay, back. Great. All right. Okay. Great stuff. Great stuff. So, um, look, uh, thank you to all the panelists. Um, thank you all so much for your insightful, insightful views. This is just, look, Nigeria is the country to be watching in 2023. Uh, so much going on. So, uh, Rolake Akinkube Filani, thank you so much. Dr. Andrew Nevin, thank you so much. Sir, Hello, let's, let's, yeah. get, let's, let's, let's get final comments from everyone. Okay, um, great. In fact, all right, so maybe the final comments. Um, um, Rola, I can start with you. Go ahead with your final comments, please, or thoughts on what to expect for this year. For this year. Well, I, I think it's going to sound very cliche, but in any crisis, there's always an opportunity to those who are willing to, to kind of search and do the hard grafting. And I truly believe that a lot of entrepreneurs are going to launch and take off this year. Always happens in a downturn. Well, All right, so brief. <laughs> uh, Dr. Andrew Nevin, what are your final comments? I mean, for those who follow me, everyone knows I'm incredibly optimistic, more optimistic than ever, despite all of the challenges that we understand. I put out with uh, your colleague, uh, Rufio Seni, our book on self-organizing Nigeria recently. I mean, I just think that the forces for good are going to are going to steamroll the forces for evil in the country. So I'm really looking for a great 2023 and a great rest of this decade for Nigeria. There's just too much talent to be suppressed. All right. And as you've said, that talent should be exported in, in, in services. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nevin. Uh, Carlo Aja, what are your, your final thoughts? Yeah, I think we're, beginning a, we're being given a great opportunity to elect a new CEO. Very important that this election, like the other ones, go out and vote. Be very deliberate. Find out what you want in a leader and vote for that leader. All we've said here can go away one policy. So the only way you can have an impact in your future is to vote for the leader you believe will do well for you, your family, and your nation. So go out and vote this month. Thank you. Thank you, Ugo. We have to get your own final thoughts as well, Ugo. Yeah, Rotus, I'm going to make mine as simple as we like as well. Um, invest in the troughs so that you can make money when it goes high, right? So invest in the trough, look out for the highs. That will be my final comment. Thank you. 
Thank you to the panelists. Thank you to Radio Now 95.3 FM. This has been streaming live there. We thank all our listeners on Radio Now 95.3 that have been following this. Uh, so with much appreciation to you. Follow Narometrics, not just narometrics.com, not just on Twitter, social, all social media, also on YouTube. Subscribe to the Narometrics um, channel on YouTube. Turn on your notifications so you can get uh, this webinar to be up there in a, in a few minutes. Thank you all so much. This has been so informative. Um, look, stay tuned. Dara Metrics has so much more. I'm Rosa Soderi. It's been a pleasure. Everybody, do take care and have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Go Aimba. Go Chelsea.